Welcome to Business Law and More, the podcast that's all about the journey, not just the destination. My name is Rena. I'm a lawyer, business owner, and managing partner of Cosbon. This podcast is for creative entrepreneurs where we discuss business insights, legal hurdles, and more to help you build a business and life that you love. Thanks for spending time with me today. Turn up the volume and let's begin. Today, we're going to be talking about business structures and the different business structures, all the differences and why you choose one over the other. We've got some great takeaway nuggets of information for you at the end of the show. So make sure that you listen all the way through and stay tuned. Now it's time to welcome my guest, Smyl Mokrine. He is a solicitor at Carter Bond. He's a corporate lawyer and he's going to be explaining all the differences and all the perks of each one and why one is more suited to another. Thank you for joining us, Smyl. Well, thanks for having me, Rain. I'm really looking forward to having a chat with you about it. Podcast, best of many. This year, I can't wait to get stuck in. <laughs> Excellent. Let's get to it then. I know that as a corporate lawyer myself, we have business owners who contact us and when we tell them that you are buying and what are you buying and how are you buying it? And they respond a little bit blankly and you can just see them on the other side of the phone with a question mark on their head. Well, it's me buying. And you're like, but that's right. Are you buying in your personal name? Are you setting up a new company or how are you doing this? And I suppose that's the different nuances because there's many different types of business structures. Can you just name the most common ones, if you like, and then we can talk through each one possibly? Yeah, as you said, it's, it's something that comes up quite a lot with new clients and it's a very important part of the process. And one of the main things you try to get from the start is the different forms of business, as you've said. And the main ones we come across are sole trader, partnerships, limited liability partnerships, and limited companies. And there's various reasons why you'd pick one over the other. And mainly it's for tax reasons, personal reasons, or the, the big one we come across is limited uh, liability because a lot of people want to just to make sure that they're covered from that angle. Make sense. People still trade as sole traders? They do. I actually believe that there's more sole traders at the minute than there are limited companies, just because a lot of people like having their own finances themselves. And therefore, if you're a sole trader, you don't have to publish your earnings and things like that. So that's one of the main reasons that we come across is why people enjoy being sole traders. That's interesting, actually. You're right, because you're not incorporated. You've got no legal responsibility to make your accounts information public. So you could just carry on a business as being a pop hat, trading as correspond without having the limited company and no one needs to know anything. Exactly that. But then one of the biggest drawbacks is you aren't able to distinguish your business earnings from your financial personal savings. So that's one of the main reasons we would say if you want to make sure that you have your separate entity and you've got your business account from your personal account, we would advise that you perhaps go into a limited company. But also as a sole trader, there's no limitation liability. If anything happens to the business, it's all the guarantee and all the personal liabilities on you. We need to make sure that they're aware of that if they want to be a sole trader. Really good points there, actually. The first one is about the finances because it's all blurred, isn't it, actually? So if the sole trader did ever want to sell the business, they would find it difficult, probably not impossible, but difficult to separate what is from the business to then give the business a value as opposed to what is their own earnings. Exactly that. And we've had a lot of instances where some clients have wanted to buy a sole trader kind of business, but they've wanted them to transfer all their assets and all those business parts of their earnings into a limited company to then buy that limited company on its own. They don't want to buy something that's, as you say, mixed altogether because they just want the, want the good parts and the, the business parts of that sole trader. Makes sense. And actually, but you're right. And the only reason why somebody would do, carry on and operate as a sole trader is, as you said, for tax purposes, or if they didn't want to make available their confidential information on the public domain and the footprint. You touched on another point as well, which was that the liability perspective, and that's massive because if you are a sole trader, my understanding is that you're responsible for all the liabilities as well. So all the bad stuff, if you like. That's it. There's no limitation. There's no cap. You are responsible for everything, which is why you'll normally find that sole traders are much more businesses, though, that if they do get into financial trouble, there's not much liability behind them. But one of the big steps is as a sole trader, when you're starting to gain a lot more momentum and lots more profit, that's when people normally come to us and say, what should we do? Should we go into a trade into a limited company? And that's when we say, it's probably the best thing you can do because you pay less tax on profits, you can pay corporation tax as opposed to income. And as I say, it limits the liability to the company instead of then individually. If you're starting to build a momentum and make lots of profit, we'll probably say venture into a limited company because it'll back you from there. Yeah, interesting. 
And basically what that means is that once you're liable as a sole trader, your liabilities are personal. That means that your personal assets could be at risk in case the business didn't do well or anything like that. Then there is no ring fence there, if you like, to protect you. You are exposed. Exactly that. There's no ring fence. It's your house your personal savings, your own assets on the line, which is why you need to make sure that if you're starting to make a lot of money, there potentially comes a downfall of a lot of liability with creditors and things like that. So that's when you need to start thinking about going to a limited company mm-hmm. or an LLP, which mm-hmm. is the limited liability part you spoke about. Makes sense as well. I suppose the other benefit of a sole trade is that you could set up very quickly. You could just decide today, I'm going to be a sole trader. This is my business and the way off you go. Well, that's it. A lot of people don't like the administration side of it. And that's one of the drawbacks of a limited company because you have to keep companies' house up to date with filings such as accounts and confirmation statements. And there are certain accountancy rules as well that you have to fill. And a lot of people don't like having to pay standard fees every year to make sure that they're in line with uploading things to companies' house and things like that. So sole trader, no admin really, just make sure you've got a good accountant on side and, and that's all you need to do as sole trader. Fantastic. So the second one that you talked about was partnership. Very different to a sole trader. A sole trader, the name gives it away, one person, solo, off you go. But a partnership is two or more people? Partnership is two or more people and it's a lot different from a sole trader, but liability-wise, it's actually quite similar because a partnership as sole trader is not limited. And that means that if one of the partners, for example, got into trouble and got sued, then the others would be jointly liable. A partnership is sole trainer in a way, but just with more people. So you still have that drawback of no limitation liability, which is something we'd always advise clients. The main difference is a sole trader is one person doing business, but a partnership is two or more people doing business, basically. And the liability is still the same. It's just between them. Exactly. And a lot of small partnerships, as I say, don't want to publish their accounts, don't want to publish their earnings and just want to have it off record so that that just confidentiality reasons, really. A lot of people don't like posting their earnings. But as I said, same with the partnership as a sole trader. Once you start gaining momentum, that's when you need to think about, is this really worth personally guaranteeing the liabilities that may come? Makes sense. And I remember the Partnership Act is dated 1890. That is ridiculously old. It's really outdated. And when we do get the few inquiries in relation to setting up partnerships, we always advise that it's a very expensive course because the law is so dated and so old and you have to go back so many years to try and make sure that it's working within the 1890 Act, as you say. It's so outdated that we would probably say stay clear from it because it's just, it's not in line with... 1890, that's like dinosaur age. <laughs> it's, we don't come across new inquiries a lot in relation to partnerships, other limited liability partnerships, yes, but partnerships generally outdated. At the yeah, totally. But I also remember actually partnerships at well, the Partnership Act 1890. It doesn't apply to business nowadays and how we work nowadays. For example, it's got some nuances in there to say that unless until you've got a partnership agreement setting out some terms, then if there's two or more partners, one of them dies, then the partnership comes to an end. And then the next day, if you continue working in this exactly the same way, same name, etc., but that then sets up a new partnership. It also, I remember reading that there's something in there to say that doesn't matter what share of partnership we're in, I could put in 70% and you could put in 30%. But if we don't have a partnership agreement, then technically everything is equal. So you've benefited from this, right? That's a really good point, actually, because we had a client want to purchase a accounting firm a couple of years ago, and we got to the end of the due diligence, having spent lots and lots of money trying to find out more about the partnership. And we eventually found out that one of the partners actually died, and therefore the partnership ceased to have effect, which meant that wow. all the assets had passed to the family members, and therefore they were purchasing it from the wrong person, essentially. It fell through for that reason. So as you say, if there's no partnership agreement in place, then it's a free-for-all, and it could be the family that actually owns the assets instead of the partnership itself. Wow, I bet there's so many different horror stories on this as well. So the key is, if there's going to be a partnership, then you need to have a partnership agreement. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like really, who owns what proportions are going to who, and how much each person's put in, and how much each person attributes, and therefore gets out of it respectively. I suppose also you need to have in there some deadlock provisions as well, because if there's two of you, how do you decide anything if, there, if there's a deadlock? Definitely, fifty is always a complex matter, mm-hmm. and it's something we come up across very regularly, especially with limited companies as well, and for People that don't know the general rules, you have to have more than 50% to be able to push a decision through in a company. 
And if it's 50-50 and there's no documents in place and you two disagree, then the company essentially comes to a standstill. And another example, we had a big client a couple of years ago that was deadlock and I think it was about 20, 25 million turnover, a very good established company, and they couldn't come to a decision. And a couple of weeks later, the bank pulled all the funding, all the resources, because they said, if you can't trade as a normal company, then that's that. So it's very important to get documents like that in place. Wow. Yeah. And especially with the act being dinosaur age, 18, 90, we look forward to that being revised soon one day. Brilliant. So we talked about some part, some trader and partnership. Really interesting. The third one you mentioned was LLP. So that's limited liability partnership. Oh, sorry, that's essentially the same as a partnership, but it's got the limited element within it. What does that mean? This means that you are limited to the amount you put in essentially, instead of it being unlimited, uncapped, as you would have with a partnership. For example, say there's three partners who want to enter into a limited liability partnership. You all put £20,000 in. Your cap is to the money you've put in. So no more, no less. And we see a lot of them at the moment. And it's a good way to start a business. And it's effectively just as well run as a limited company. This is what we'd normally tend to see. That's interesting. When you say that it's limited, you mean that the liability of the partners is limited to whatever they put into the business? That's it. There can become situations where your creditors, so the people that you owe money to in the limited liability partnership, outweighs your assets. So what the partnership is worth, essentially. And when it gets to that stage, that's when the liability stops. What happens is if you owe more than you are making in the partnership, instead of you being personally liable, the partnership will either go into liquidation or have some effect that way instead of actually you paying that deficit. Got it. So there is some protection there for the partners. So it's run like a partnership. But your liability or the partner's liability is limited. But I suppose the drawback of this is that it needs to be incorporated. So all the information about who the partners are, their accounts, etc., is all going to be on the public domain. Well, this is it. This is the same issue with the limited company. And there are certain accounting rules that if you reach over a certain amount of turnover and you have a certain amount of employees that you have to, for example, firstly publish accounts and follow the same rules as you would do with a, a limited liability company, but also you would have to publish how much people are earning and how much the highest um, member is earning as well, which a lot wow. of people don't like. Okay. Wow. So there's pros and cons, isn't there, actually? And we're not going to touch on the tax bit because neither of us, well, I don't know about you, but I can't do math. No, neither can I. And with an LLP then, do you need to have an agreement similar to a partnership? It's exactly the same. I would say from the first day, make sure that agreement's in place so that everyone knows what they're doing. Everyone knows how much they put in percentage wise. And also it's quite important to have that in place for drawings. So for an LLP, it's drawings that we take out of business for the partners. So just to avoid any confusion, any dispute later down the line, if it's in black and white written down, then it's much easier to um, avoid any dispute. And is that LLP agreement a private document or does that need to be on the public domain at company's house as well? It is. It's private, which is one of the good things about having it in the background. You'll have your accounts and your confirmation statements public, but you'll have that in the background. It's much like a shareholders agreement for a limited company. Fantastic. Brilliant. That's really interesting. And then the final one you mentioned was the, the most common, I won't say most common, actually. I say most known is the limited companies. This is the one we as listeners come across most, yeah. to be honest. Just so much easier to run. And I think because of the Companies Act, which is 2006, much more up to date than the 1890 March Act, I think it's a lot more transparent as to what people need to do and there's updates in the law effectively every month with different cases so I think people like that transparency and knowing exactly what rules to follow and if they don't they know how to rectify it quite quickly. So with a limited company I know that there are shareholders who own like a slice of the company depending on the shares and we do have a different podcast for shareholder agreements so make sure you listen to that just a plug in there but with a limited company that is on the public domain so that's a firmly a company's house isn't it? Limited company, everything's public. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the confirmation statement, the accounts, the directors, the shareholders, and the secretary as well. Everything's black and white. Everyone can see it to view. And when we work in merger and acquisition files, that's beneficial to a prospective buyer because they want to know everything is in black and white and it's just able to view. It's a lot easier to deduct the value of the company because everything's so open. So as a prospective buyer, we normally find that they like buying limited companies because it's much easier for them to see how much the company's worth effectively. Yeah, interesting. And with companies, you have to have articles of association. 
you do. So this, yeah, this is lost on quite a lot of people. Mm. Articles are very important and a lot of people know that there's been a recent change in case law that if a company is set up with model articles, which is just standard articles that companies house with no amendments, just they essentially follow the Companies Act, then a sole director cannot make decisions by themselves. That's one thing we've come across quite recently. Our advice would always be if you're going to set up a limited company, ensure that you've got up-to-date articles that have provisions in such as preemption rights, for example. So what that means is a shareholder can't transfer their shares to any random person without having the authority of the other shareholders. And you can have fancy provisions in there, such as good lever, bad lever, which essentially, if you're a good lever and the directors think that you've, you've been a good shareholder, then you get fair value. And a bad lever, for example, gross misconduct, then you get one pound for each share that you have. So there's lots of provisions you can include in there. That's interesting. And then these provisions, sometimes people put them in the articles, but they, other times they put it into a shareholders agreement. My understanding why they do one over the other is that if it's in the articles, it's going to be on the public domain, public records. Everyone can see when you're a good lever and a bad lever and all the rest of it. Whereas if it's in the shareholders agreement, that's a private document. Nobody gets to see it. You can have it. But the key is that the articles and the shareholders agreement talk to each other. Exactly that. Mm-hmm. So we normally try and marry them up. Shareholders agreement is between the shareholders and is a private document, as you say. And the difference with the articles are they bind the shareholders, but also bind the company. So it's a contract with the company and the shareholders as well. And it differs from what client and what their aims are, really. So we see a lot of articles that have all the provisions in, but a lot of people would prefer them to have in a private confidential document in the background and then just standard articles on the company's house so that no one else knows what they have in there because with the shareholders agreement you can have so much more for the shareholders for example bonus schemes you can have different kinds of profit allocations to different shareholders and the thing with the shareholders agreement is they can also give minority shareholders a lot of power which is what we see a lot at the moment and you mentioned something which was quite fascinating that you can set up a limited company pretty much within 24 hours or asap and you can have model articles Now, the model articles say that for any decision that needs to be made, there needs to be a quorum of two directors. But if you go and set up a company and click the button for model articles and there's only one director, you're bothered. (laughs) Yes, you are. So you can do absolutely nothing apart from appointing another director, which kind of defeats the objective of being a sole director of a company. Oh, wow. So you'd have to appoint another director to then amend, go back and then amend the articles to say it can be one person. Oh, wow. Model model Article 40, it says that the only decision you can make is to appoint someone else so that you have standard quorum, which is two. Wow. So all the people listening, if you've got limited companies, check your articles. If you're a sole director with model articles, make sure you update them ASAP. Because if they've been doing business all this time, they're going to have to go and ratify. I go back and then redo some of it as well. But that's a painful task in itself. Exactly that. So if you've been carrying on business as normal and, for example, having board meetings or sole director resolutions, as we call for a sole director, then it's probably not been doing in line with the company's act. So we definitely don't tell you to double check the articles and make sure they're in line with your company's needs. And make sure that the company doesn't have table A. Yes. What's table A? <laughs> table A's even, even older. Just it's all age. Like age, exactly. Yeah, table A was before 2006, but goes back way before. And if you have got table A articles, you must get in touch with the solicitor and get them updated as soon as possible. Be- Most recent before 2006 was 1985, wasn't it? And then it goes back way before that. Yeah. There's lots of different take place. Way before I was born. <laughs> Not going to give my age away. That's really interesting. And then there's one more that I wanted to touch on, which is CIC, which is Community Interest Company. And this is something we don't tend to come across a lot at the moment because nowadays people tend to do GoFundMe pages and things like that. But CIC or Community Interest Companies are essentially done for non-for-profit organizations and they're set up for charities and most importantly with the CIC the liability is what we call limited by guarantee which means that everybody's due to the company their liability is limited to a pound which makes sense as it's it was for charity purposes so you don't want people to go in and try and help a charity in, in need and then have low liability resting on you. Interesting thank you and that's also registered at Companies House as well so that's on the public domain. Exactly the same as a limited company, but the limitation is due to a pound for how much you put in. Fantastic. Brilliant. So we went through sole trader, partnership, 
NLP Limited Company, and then finally CIC. So much information there, Smile. Thank you so much. I hope our listeners were scribbling away or saving this podcast. Thank you very much for having me and uh, can't wait for the next one. Brilliant. Thank you, Smile. Thanks for listening to Business Law and More, a Cosbomb podcast. Before we go, if you enjoy the podcast, please follow and subscribe to the show. Share the podcast or tell a friend about it. Leave us a review and stay tuned for more next week.